a lot to cover. Thank you for being here. I know that this is most of our nap times. Hi there, honey. <laughs> All these wonderful faces in the audience. So we're here today, update uh, on employment on the autistic spectrum, which has been a hot topic so far today in a few sessions. So first off, I'd like to introduce you over there, the man with the very cool hat, Michael Burnick, former director of EDD, SM board member and parent. Next, uh, we're going to, well, first we're going to hear from him from the top down on federal and state initiatives on what's cooking, what's happening now, what's going to be happening in the near future, which I think is important. Then uh, next, we're going to hear from me, uh, Eva Libri, Denise uh, Bradley from uh, Harambe and about uh, programming online or coming online. So both agencies, along with a bunch of other agencies we'll mention, are doing uh, autism at work type programs or other embedded supported type employment. So we'll be looking at that briefly. And lastly, we have Rowan Timmerman, whose name I spelled correctly on this slide, Rowan, on what it's like to be boots on the ground, what it's like to be a young adult uh, with autism, seeking employment, and now working. So first up, we have Michael. Thank you, Jan. Um, I, um, Jan today asked me to talk about um, some of the state initiatives and what's going on in terms of funding, uh, which I will. Let me say before, I, uh, as Jan said, I'm a parent. I've been involved in the autism community since 1991. Um, like many of you, I've seen it change from people knowing autism largely from Rain Man to the situation we have today in which um, in terms of pop culture, you can't pick up a newspaper or um, turn on the TV or um, movies or radio without a mention of autism. So in pop culture, it's certainly changed a lot. K through 12 has changed a lot. Employment has changed relatively little. Um, there is a lot going on, but in terms of the overall numbers in our community um, of employment and unemployment, not really changed a lot since um, 1991. And if, if we have time, we'll discuss some of the reasons for that. But um, I think today I want to focus on um, you know, as I say, some of the state initiative positive things going on. How do I move the, to my next slide? Are you, um, oh. Let me say also, um, as Jan knows, I'm a volunteer job coach. So I'm an attorney, but I am a volunteer job coach. So if you have any questions, you have my contact information here and would like to give me a call, I'm glad to. Um, you know, I've been through a lot in terms of a, lot, a number of autism job searches and um, am always happy to speak with other parents and family members and people on the spectrum in terms of their own job searches and um, what, what works. Um, now, in terms of the state level, um, I think there are a couple um, new things in 20, going into 2018 that I think we need to look at, I think are promising. One, DDS, this is for regional center clients. For the first time, we have a major funding source, about 20 million a year, in what's known as the paid internship program. The reason I like this so much is because I believe the best thing we need is direct employment. We don't need more job training in most cases. We don't need job search workshops. We don't need resume writing. Most of the people in our Ascend group um, have been through tens of these. Uh, we need jobs. And what this paid internship program provides is money to subsidize up to 100% of wages. So if, if you are a regional center client or know someone who's a regional clinic, center client or is work or are working with someone who's a regional center client, this is a good new source of funding to get someone in. You have to show that there is, quote, a reasonable expectation that, that the internship will lead to 
unsubsidized employment, but it's a very good source. We haven't had this before in California. Two, um, EDD, my old department, um, has a number of new initiatives and funding focused on, um, well, I don't use the term disability, but they call it the Disability Employment Accelerator. Um, and um, I see, Jan, that our friend Trish is here from Expandability, which um, is one program that's received money from this. Um, Trish, if we have time, hopefully you can tell us about some of the things. But this is money focused on our community and more generally people with developmental differences, all focused. Fortunately, EDD has also moved to a model that says we want to place people directly into jobs. So what Trish and Jan are part of is what's known as a NOVA Talent Partnership. This is a program to focus. This focuses on adults with autism, um, but placement into jobs. Um, DOR has a new program that just this year, SB 644. Uh, is anyone involved in SB 644? This is a good one. You have to be a DOR client, but um, this is one where the state government, for years, um, Jan, we've been pushing, uh, saying to state government, even when I was there and before, look, you're telling everyone else to hire people with developmental differences. Time for the state to do that, you know, or local governments. You know, they're all saying, you, you know, lecturing us, lecturing employers, time for the state to. Well, this is a first step. SB 644 is a small internship program. They're talking about hundreds of interns. They're starting small. It's, I think, um, they've got seven slots in Sacramento, another two or three here in the Bay Area. But it's something, if you're a DOR client, know someone who's a DOR client, it's to get, get into state government on a fully paid internship. Um, we don't need any of this non-paid stuff anymore. Um, the fully paid internship that will hopefully lead into a regular state job. So that's one thing new from this year. And then finally, um, with the California Workforce Development Fund, using the federal job training funds, the so-called WIOA funds, there's um, a targeting of, again, they use the term workers with disabilities. I don't like that, but um, you know, a new focus on money targeted at you know, our community and others with developmental differences. So within the state system, there's um, um, money, new initiatives, you know, and this builds on, of course, the extensive network that we already have in California. Um, the DOR um, job placement, job coaching services, I advise everyone, sign up for DOR. And if you can, sign up for Regional Center too, but sign up for DOR. There are a lot of good services. They don't guarantee a job, but they will um, both help in job placement. Um, hopefully, they will get you over to Evil Libra. Um, and they will also help with an area that's becoming increasingly important in our community, which is job retention. Um, they, you, if you're a DOR client, you're eligible for both job placement services and job retention. In some ways, I think we're learning that job retention is even more important. Um, obviously, if you can sign up for Regional Center, you want to do that because they also have an array of job placement and retention services, free. Uh, and the nice thing about Regional Center, even more so than DOR, Regional Center um, will give you job coaching, that is retention services, for as long as you need. There's no time limit on it. Um, DOR is a little bit tighter in terms of its um, time limit. Um, EDD, of course, has its network of job placement, job placement through the American Job Centers. And then, of course, there are the state-funded groups also um, that we have, um, the Specialist Guild, ARC, PRC, Pomeroy Center. The point is that there's a network out there. I always tell everyone, don't go it alone. There are a lot of people, A, you want to reach out to Ascend and the volunteer groups in our community, but also you want, there's a lot of state resources focused on one thing, which is get people into jobs. Um, now, what does this mean for you? Well, as I say, it, you want to register with DOR and Regional Center, um, you know, right away. Um, and um, then you want to reach out 
um, to these various resources. Um, and again, I would push, I'm a big fan of these extra governmental groups also from a job placement. Uh, David Platzer is here. He coordinates our Ascend Job Club. And we meet on a monthly basis. Everyone is welcome. It's in downtown San Francisco. And we focus on bringing in speakers from various companies. We've had Salesforce, Airbnb, to A, let them know about our community, but B, to um, try to put together specific initiatives. And David, if we have time, maybe you can say something more on that. Um, and finally, I'd say, um, I think what we've learned, there's a big emphasis on getting in the door. Our job market um, in California, I grew up in California in the 50s and 60s. It was a different type of employment then. It was more full-time employment with benefits, not for everyone, but it was more the norm. Well, today we know what the job market is. It's a breakdown of this full-time employment with the rise of the contingent economy. It makes it even more important for us to get in the door, and that could be through part-time work. Um, it could be through project work. It could even be through volunteer work when the volunteer work is well structured. Jen, I don't believe in, in you know, too much our community has been asked to do things for free. So it's, you know, volunteer work can be good, but we want to make sure that volunteer work is structured into some paid employment. But I think that's a, a big thing going forward in 2018. Take advantage of the resources, the many resources we have, to try to get involved in some of the volunteer groups and extra governmental groups, and three, be flexible. Look at ways of getting in that may not be full-time work, but may allow you to get in, show what you can do, and, um, um, and then hopefully lead to more structured employment. Finally, Jan, I want to say something about uh, 2018 and uh, what I think is going to be and is moving to, and that's the focus on the more severely impacted in our community. Now, Trish and I were just talking before this about um, these shows like uh, The Good Doctor. How many people have seen The Good Doctor? All right, I hate it. I'll tell you why. I, I, well, I'll be interested to hear what other things, but I'll tell you why I hate it. Um, it continues the narrative of autism as savants, autism as, you know, having these exceptional abilities. That's the worst. I think, uh, how many have seen Atypical? Yeah, that's not as bad. But the guy has sort of a near savant, um, you know, knowledge of penguins and rare fish and Antarctica. Uh, I, you know, it, it really continues a narrative that we've seen in pop culture um, of autism as savant or near savant skills. Um, I would argue, in fact, that hurts many of our employment efforts because it leaves behind a good portion of our community. I would say at least a third or more who are more severely impacted. And I think the good news is that people are beginning to realize this. We're beginning to understand that there's a role in the labor market for all of our community, not just people who can diagnose you know, liver diseases that everyone else misses. Um, there's a place for everyone. That's, I think, going to be a big focus. It's a focus of mine in 2018 and going forward. There's a place for everyone. So there's a, a small program, Dr. Vismira, who has a son who's severely impacted, is doing in Sacramento um, with the long-term care industry. His son is a regional center client. We've got an employment program there. Um, there are other potential projects going on. Again, all focused on the more severely impacted and all with a simple message, there's a role for everyone. It's not just you know, savants or so forth, but there's a role for everyone. So I'll leave it with that. Excellent. Now, the one thing I will say in defense of the good doctor, some of the graphics in the program are done by an autistic youth out of exceptional minds in Southern California. To me, that's rocking. So not for us, without us, right? So yeah, I mean, all of that too. So I'm going to talk a little bit about programming for less impacted individuals. Uh, and again, this is really 
30,000 foot level. I would love to have two full days with y'all to go over and all these people and those people to really talk about what's happening, but this is high level. So what I'm seeing at Evo Libri right now is the autism at work model, which many of you know about, um, continues to move forward. Uh, we're seeing it, certainly it's still at SAP, which is sort of where it started. Um, it's at Microsoft, Google, Cisco, we're all talking about it, HP. Um, showing interest, starting small programs, but there's nothing really terribly visible to the mainstream population for folks to start applying to. Um, we have seen some revamping, which I think is good. You know, we've been doing this now for anywhere from five to 10 years. So there's some revamping of programs. Our friends uh, at Expandability are here. They took the original Expandability and completely redid it. And now it's Autism Advantage, which is a program that's been up since June? March. March, sorry. Um, and now how many cohorts have you run? Three, Three cohorts. Um, and that's, you know, that's wonderful. And that they've refocused it a little bit from a pure autism at work to now more data science and IT. So it's a little broader. Um, the, it's a training program that is uh, really pretty phenomenal. I know this firsthand because I sent my son to it. <laughs> this is how I get my intel. I make my kids go do things for me. Um, and he really liked it. And he, like many high functioning Aspies, has a pretty high opinion of himself. And he found that he learned a lot, so it was really good. Um, the Specialist Guild also has just recently, uh, by the way, Expandability is in San Jose, Specialist Guild is in San Francisco. They've also kind of reformatted, rebooted, and they're also focusing more on the IT. So there are uh, you know, programs that are going on for the higher functioning kids. The problem that we're seeing is that the large scale focus really isn't there yet. Companies keep saying, oh, it's such a great idea, but um, people lose their jobs, they transfer. Um, you know, somebody comes in who says, well, that may have been a good idea before, but we're not terribly interested now. So these are projects that take several years to get off the ground. So it takes a while, and, you know, business moves on. Um, so we're seeing still a lack of focus, um, and most efforts are small. Right? So most of the companies are doing really small focus, anywhere from two or three employees to maybe as many as 12. We've got a lot more people to hire. We're also seeing hybrid programs. That's more what we do, um, where we help uh, individuals, companies, develop their own AAW type programs, help them develop their return on investments, how they're gonna sell it to management, that kind of thing. Um, also help them understand how, how and where they're gonna get their uh, people. You know, so then we reach back out to other organizations like Expandability and that kind of thing. So we work together. Also work with Department of Rehab on uh, opening pipelines. So we're seeing a couple of those programs that we hope will come online here in the next uh, year, hopefully. Um, again, very slow, a lot of people to sell it to. I'm thankful that I had those 20 years in high tech management. And part of my job was change management, selling really difficult change to lots of people, <laughs> which is sort of what this is. So we're seeing you know, some of those programs come online, but they're gonna be small. And I'm hoping that what we really have is more and more really small companies make an investment, right? Just because you have 50 or 100 employees doesn't mean you know, a couple of them can't be on the spectrum. It doesn't all have to be Google. So I want everybody to think about that and take that home with them tonight about how can they help move the needle here. So the issue continues to be corporations are, their interest is primarily in tech. I'd like to see more branching into other areas. Tech is kind of the low hanging fruit, I think, and I'm glad we're doing it, but for every person I have who comes in who's interested in technology, I have a person who is interested in animals, healthcare, uh, health services, med tech, arts, marketing, accounting, business. And so we have to start looking at what else is out there in terms of programming that we might be able to just grab off the shelf, 
like, hmm, De Anza's Wildlife Corridor Tech, which I'd love to see. Can you imagine? I, I know for most of the people I know who are on the spectrum, not maybe most, but maybe a third of them, to tell them to go out and sit in the field and count different kinds of hawks <laughs> and get paid for it? <laughs> That's a dream. So why aren't we doing that, right? So there's lots of different things that we can get going here, but we need more people to commit, more people to understand, so we can move some of these programs forward. So through WIOA, which we've talked about, DOR, and CDE, there's now more and more interest in transition age programming. I'll keep my thoughts to myself about, about time, but at least hopefully it's going to happen. So it's unclear right now what that means. We as an agency attend all kinds of meetings and listen to like really, really long teleconferences and we understand about one out of every five words, but we're trying to break the code to see how we can help do this type of thing. What I'd really like to see is more transition to work type programming. If you don't know about Foothills program, go find out about it because what she's doing, Teresa Ong, is developing non-credit classes that are vocationally based that kids can take to learn how to be an entrepreneur and put their stuff up on Etsy and Pinterest. So there's a lot of different ways to do this. So the downside is, is that school districts in particular don't have a lot of funding don't have a lot of uh, subject matter expertise and have difficulty running transition plans that actually work in the real world. So we'd love to see that change. We actually, as an agency, do a lot of transition plans. Um, I'd love to be able to train everybody how to do it. <coughs> so the issues here continue to be poor training and resources for special education staff to understand not only how to write a transition plan, but what's available out there? Because it takes a lot of work to stay in touch with everybody and to you know, just even say, I'm going to spend an hour on Google and just search and see what I find, right? Because it changes every couple of weeks. But we really need that. We have poor linkages between agencies. I'll let those agencies fend for themselves on that, but we've seen it. And we have a definite lack of focus on soft skills. So these are the skills that oftentimes our kids most sorely lack. They might be great academically, can't advocate for themselves, don't know how to get around uh, taking a bus, um, don't know how to make small talk, all of those things that are really important for these kids, but they're not getting the training or support on how to do it. So. Clients, parents, advocates, everyone in this room, we need to keep pushing for better outcomes. Keep pushing for better outcomes. Uh, like all career development, no matter where your young person or your client start, it's a process, not an event. Sorry. <laughs> you don't get to say, oh, thank God, he got a job, I'm done. You're not done. Just like your own career was a process, right? Now you have to teach them how to get the next job. Sorry. Um, and it takes a while. Um, the issues here continue to be the misunderstandings of the services that are available across the board, right, from age, well, from middle school through adulthood. The missing linkages, I think, is a real problem, and the possibilities. So for that, I would say, you know, ask questions, network, as Michael said, and stay tuned. I do want to give one shout out. Um, we are going to be launching at Eva Libre, hopefully Q1, a uh, career development webinar for salaried professionals on the spectrum. So this will be free of charge for people to log in and to be able to learn something new, excuse me, that hopefully will help them develop their own careers over time. It's as Michael noted, there's not a lot about retention. Um, DOR pays for three months. 
but this is an ongoing need, and so we hope that this will be a way to start filling that big need. Anyhow, next we're going to hear from Denise. Hi, my name is Denise Bradley, and I'm the Executive Director of Harambe Community Services. And we are an organization that runs specialized day programs for people who have complex challenges. Uh, two years ago, we went from being a site-based program to fully community-based. And uh, about six months ago, we got a home and community-based waiver grant to transition our programs to uh, support employment. <clears throat> so my background is working with people that have exuberant behaviors. I didn't know very much about support employment. I've had kind of a quick and dirty uh, education about it in the last year, and I wanted to share with you some of the things that I've learned about it. So we work with people who have um, exuberant behaviors, uh, mental health, diagnoses. Some of our folks have a history of substance abuse and we also work with people who are under probation or parole. And so one thing that we've learned in the last year is that people who have severe challenges can successfully work. Um, and I'll tell you a little bit more about what kind of work they're doing in a moment. Um, we also found that focusing on the individual and what they're interested in and what they're good at also helps us do a better job of making a fit between them and the job that they would like. We also uh, define jobs as microenterprises, um, part-time work is very valued. valued. Um, we have a lot of people doing manual labor outside, and we like to expose our participants to a variety of environments and identify what they appear to love. We've also tried to engage our parents, advocates, and residential providers in all aspects of the job development. So as part of our grant, we are looking at models, not only in California, but across the nation to see what kinds of programs are working for people that have severe challenges, and what kinds of things don't work. So one of the things that we've uh, decided to use is a braided model. And braided model is um, day program coupled with support employment. So um, the braided model uses day program hours to develop a plan, provide soft skills training, and develop jobs. And the support employment part works on um, coaching and providing supports that the person needs to be successful in keeping the job. So our program, because we work with people that have a lot of challenges, are very customized. Many of our folks have one-to-one -one staffing or one-to-two staffing, and we have a few that have one-to-three. But we try to customize the services and supports they need from referral through job maintenance. We have a multidisciplinary team that provides and develops wraparound services to address skill development and also specific challenges. And our current team members include a BCDA, an occupational therapist, our transportation person, quality assurance staff, the program supervisor, and then specific staff and participants. Uh, the team meets weekly, and they try to address challenges and problems immediately without hysteria or panic. Um, had a little incident last week where someone had a meltdown at their job, and um, I think it was a little challenging for the employer, but everybody got through it. Um, they, we developed a what we call corrective action um, that's going to be implemented, which I think has a good chance of success. But we try not to panic when there's a challenge. Um, and then we also are focusing on soft skill development through local partnerships, like the adult school. Our program currently teaches 
We teach nine classes at the adult school, five of which are related to employment. Um, and those classes include things like get a job, work smart, which focuses on keeping a job. Um, we have what we call a men's square, which is a social skills training group where they focus on communication skills uh, and conflict resolution and things like etiquette. And we also have a uh, life skills class, which is people developing action plans for things that, for goals that they have, employment and otherwise. <clears throat> Excuse me. So um, one of the things that's important for our folks is that we do a very comprehensive environmental analysis, which includes risk factors for the person. So we spend a lot of time observing the job site before our folks go there to look at things like how much noise is there, you know, what the, <clears throat> excuse me, I'm recovering from a cold, so. Um, what kind of noise is there, how many people are there, um, what specifically does the site look like? Because um, we have people that have um, some unique challenges. Um, we have one person that doesn't like to work around people who are taller than him. Um, and so we look for a place where they had short people. Um, you laugh, but uh, <laughs> you haven't seen the meltdown that the person has, so you want to make sure that the site fits their unique needs, because we're not trying to fit them into a, a round circle. Um, so that piece is really critical for, for our folks. Um, and I have some samples of that risk form uh, that I can set out if you want to take a look at it. Um, we also look, of course, at the skills needed for the job tasks. Um, we try to place people in environments that have some element of something that they really love. Because when people love what they're doing, they typically don't have a lot of behaviors. And they typically learn the job tasks pretty quickly. Where we found uh, where people need the most support is in that soft skill area. You know, how do you do what the DOS tells you to do? Um, how do you react to the other people in the job environment? How do you get along with them? You know, are you talking to them about appropriate topics for work? Um, this seems to be something that a lot of people have some issues with. But um, <laughs> for our folks, we want to make sure that they're talking about appropriate things that you talk about with people you don't know very well, um, and that kind of thing. So that's where our social skill groups at the adult school come in. Um, we also look very closely at what the person environment fit is, because the better the fit, the more successful the person is going to be. We also look at what support does the, the person need, how those supports can be provided, and how we're going to communicate those supports to the employer. Um, we do a lot of work with the employer before our folks come on board. We're very honest with them about the types of challenges that the person has without <coughs> breaching their privacy. Um, because we want people to have a successful experience. Because our folks have a lot going on, they've experienced a lot of failures. So we want to make sure that they're going to be successful in whatever it is that they do, because that will help build their self-esteem and help them do a better job. Um, so we also stay in close touch with the employer and participant. All of our folks, with the exception of the person you see in this picture, um, has a person going to the job with them. Because Home Depot um, was not comfortable with somebody being with this person, we came up with kind of a unique way of providing job coaching to him. Um, and his boss is just really wonderful, so I put him in the picture. So the person in the picture was in a one to three group. So he had two peers um, and a staff person, and they would go out and do sort of pre-vocational activities. So twice a week, his group, his old group, which now has another person in it since he's no longer in the group, meet with him and his boss before his shift. And they kind of talk about what's been working well and maybe what things he needs to do better. And so the other two people in his group who were with him originally 
have gotten to know the boss really well. Um, they have a nice discussion. He's doing really well on the job. In fact, he just got a raise. Um, and he's been there a little over a year. And so what that does is, you know, because he wants to look good in front of his friends, he does a really good job at work because he doesn't want his friends to know that he's sloughed off. It also has helped the peers in that the boss has gotten to know them. So he's now offered a job to one of the other guys in his group um, who wasn't able to apply for the job before because he has a forensic background and he was still on, <clears throat> excuse me, he was still on um, parole. So it's been a nice win-win for everybody. We also send some of our other staff and participants to go shop at the store so they can say hello to him every day. So he's, his self-esteem is going through the roof. In fact, we can hardly get his head through the door now. <laughs> so some of the things that we've seen that works with the folks that we have employed is we look at how we can solve the employer's unmet needs. There are a lot of employers out there that want people to work maybe an hour here or an hour there or a two-hour shift. Um, our office is next door to a, <clears throat> a Mel's restaurant. And between 11 and 1, the place is jumping. It's really busy. And they have a hard time keeping up with things. And so when I was in there one day purchasing lunch, I asked to speak to the manager. And I explained to him about the new program that DDS has um, that is the paid internship. And I was saying to him, you know, we could have some people here working with you between 11 and 1. <clears throat> they can be busting the tables for you so that your other staff can do other things. And, you know, this might help you with some of the problems that you have here. Well, the fact that the person wasn't going to be on his payroll, uh, because the internship program is a pass-through through our agency, he was really excited about that and wanted to know how many people he could have. Well, the program doesn't allow you to have six people from uh, the program there at one time, but we haven't started people there yet, but he's very interested in that because we're solving a problem that he has because we're freeing up his staff to do other things. And um, we're trying to pick the people very carefully who will do a good job so that he would be open to maybe hiring them after their internship is over. So we try to look at carve-outs that might work for an employer. Um, and we're also offering a <clears throat> an incentive to our staff. Um, and we've been doing some training with them about the types of uh, positions that we're looking for for some of our stuff. So they're also coming up with some innovative ideas uh, and employers that we can approach. We're also looking for employers in niche areas. Um, in ethnic chamber of commerce, uh, new startups that don't have a lot of staff, uh, local nonprofits um, that match a participant's love or skill set. Um, we had a woman who, when she came to our program, had been kicked out of five day programs because she put her previous day program staff in the hospital. And we found out when she came to our site-based program, we had a feral cat program where we were feeding. We were part of a feral cat network in our area. And so she started working in that program. And lo and behold, she's like a cat whisperer. The feral cats were coming up to her. And I've never seen a feral cat come up to anybody. Um, and so we kind of put her in charge of that program. So we had new people coming in. She would kind of train them on where to put the food so the raccoons would need it and all that. So. We found her a volunteer job at the Cat Cafe, which is a, a program in Oakland where you can go in <clears throat> and you know have tea and look at a cat you might want to uh, adopt. And so we got her a volunteer job, and her job was to play with cats on Mondays when the place was closed. And she was like, she came into my office, she goes, I can totally do that job. And I'm like, yeah, you really can. Um, so we tried to match people with something they really love so that they didn't have to do a lot of training with her at the cat cafe about how to play with cats because that was something that she loved, something that she could do. Um, and so even though it wasn't a paid job to her, um, it was huge. We didn't have any more behaviors with her. You know, She hadn't uh, tried to stab any of the staff um, or any of the other stuff that she was doing previously. And that's because you know staff paid attention to what she liked, and you know this is no secret, but people tend to do well in situations where they're doing stuff that they like to do. 
and that includes us, me. Um, and I also talked a little bit about the DDS program that pays um, minimum wage for the internship, and then the staff incentives that we have. And this is a picture of a group that's volunteering with the regional uh, park service. So we have six people who are competitively employed. Um, we have the gentleman who works at Home Depot who started out at minimum wage and recently got an increase, and they're interested in placing another one of our individuals. So WR Enterprises offers temporary work. In fact, our participants are, am I going over? Yeah. <laughs> okay, all right. Okay, um, well, uh, we've got people who do seasonal work. Some of them are making more than my staff. Um, and we have about 35 out of the 70 people that we have who are volunteering weekly, and we had the classes at the local adult school. Okay. I'm sorry to cut you short. We all have so much to say. And like I say, you know, we want to make sure we get everybody in, number one. And number two, if we have a little bit of time afterwards, but we have to be out of here in 15 minutes. So next up, Rowan Timmerman. M-A-N-N. -N. Right. Uh, uh, testing, is this thing on? Yep. <laughs> I was just messing around. Uh, so I hope everyone is enjoying the conference today. Uh, my name is Rowan Timmerman. I'm an adult with autism, as you know. And then uh, my main interests are video games and pretty much uh, books and comics. And I love watching movies. I'm a big uh, Star Wars fan. Uh, anybody out here Star Wars fans? Anybody? Anybody excited for Last, uh, what is it called? Last Jedi, right? Just wondering. Uh, let's see. Um, I was diagnosed with autism when, before I turned three years old, and I was nonverbal until age four. Uh, when I did start to talk, I was diagnosed with hyperlexia, which was where I was learning words at a faster rate than typical children, although I could not understand all, all that I could read. Uh, my mom, my mom Jennifer, was amazed. Uh, she's she's right over there. <laughs> uh, let me see. Uh, uh, let me see. Where were they again? Uh, hang on, lost it. And so now I think that was really cool uh, that I was learning stuff and it was amazing. And where was I? Sorry, it's just uh, just really tired. Uh, does anybody here feel tired? I was just uh, yeah. It's been a long day for me. Like yeah. yeah. Uh, where was I? Um, I? I like living with my disability mainly because I enjoy having a routine like it's every day, like wake up and stuff like that, like wake up, go to school, like do work. Yeah. Um, let me see. Where was I? Uh, let me see. Um, wait, I lost it. Uh, what, I, what I normally do not like about my, my uh, disability is that I have difficulty remembering things and then... Uh, and then it's sometimes getting along with other people is really hard. Like, has anybody, like, had trouble with their siblings or something? I, that, that can get, like, real, real annoying or something. <laughs> like, seriously, has anybody ever had a good relationship here? I don't think so. <laughs> uh, let's see. Uh, uh, when I was younger, I had to be on medication for, like, anxiety and stuff. So, but then there was, like, some side effects. So then we just bumped it right off. Um, oops. Just do that. Uh, um, I live at home with my mom and stepdad, who are just uh, sitting right there, as I mentioned earlier. Uh, let's see. Um, my sister and brother do not have any real disabilities. I don't get along very well, as I just said. <laughs> uh, I feel like a broken record, <laughs> uh, because they sometimes find me irritating. Uh, my mom helps us to try to get along as best as possible. Uh, and then, uh, um, online shopping is one of my favorite things to do. So, like, I look around. I'm like, has anybody ever, ever? It's a big new thing. So, yeah, I thought I might, thought I might try it, and then uh, there was good experience. Uh, let's see. Uh, then I started in special education when I was diagnosed, and then I went to special day classes until fourth grade. Then I was switched to private school. Um, I went to two different private schools in San Jose, but I had trouble making friends and doing my homework. So then they decided to try public school again, where there were more kids to try to be friends with. Uh, for most of high school, I was, uh, sorry, just had a little, 
for, I was able to do part special education and then part general education classes with the assistance of a specially trained one-on-one -on -one aide. Uh, his name was John. He was very nice and helpful. He is now in the process of starting to be a teacher at my school, which is kind of pretty cool. Uh, I'm also doing uh, my senior year on my own without him, So, but it's so far so good. Uh, at school, my favorite classes uh, have been ceramics, culinary class, and PE. Uh, my hardest classes are still English and biology. Like, English is really hard. Um, I finally passed algebra after taking it for a few years, and then I didn't have to worry about math anymore. So that's, that's pretty much uh, over. Um, I find the English class hard, very difficult, because writing is a challenge for me. I enjoy reading, but then coming out with my own writing, like, uh, it's harder for me. Um, typing is easier for me than writing with a pen or pencil, but it still takes me a while to write my uh, school papers. Uh, let me see. I'm a member of a teen, teen and young, young adult social group uh, run by my mom, Jennifer. Uh, super amazing. Uh, let's see. Uh, where was I? Dang it. Uh, I've been in this group for a few years now. I have made friends in this group, and they just celebrated my 19th birthday, which was uh, October 28th, just, just a few months ago. And... Uh, uh, where was I? Uh, sorry, just why am I? Uh, hang on. Uh, sorry, I just need a need a breather for a sec. <sighs> um, maybe if I just take off. Sorry. Um. Uh, um I feel that this group is important. <clears throat> uh. Did not, I did not have the foresight to pack a drink or something. I'm just uh, a little. How much water? Uh, oh, it's coffee. Uh, Do I dare give this to you? Uh, no, I'm fine. <laughs> no, I'm just, Never mind. Thank you. Hey, thanks. Uh, let's see. Uh, the only time. No, wait. That wasn't where I was. <laughs> Silly. Uh, should I skip to that part? Yeah, I'm just gonna just gonna go ahead and uh, um, I'm currently employed as a part-time server at a valley at a retirement community called Valley Village, located in Santa Clara. Uh, I've been there now for almost a year and a half. Um, I started this job summer of last year, 2016, um, when I had decided not to go to summer school, which I personally thought was uh, was just pointless and boring. Like, what's the point of it? Like, it's just like you go to school again and then you just learn other stuff. Am I right? <laughs> <laughs> Like it's just it's just you just sit there and then you do other do other stuff. It, I mean you do the same thing every day. So, or it was just just weird stuff that's not even school related, like crossing the street. Like, can you believe me? No, I'm serious. That was I'm serious. That was that was that was one of the stupidest summer school I've ever been to. Am I right? <laughs> uh, uh, let's see. Where was I? Um, let me see. My mom said that if I didn't want to go to summer school, that I would have to pick a job which was all right. Um, and I really wanted to do something more than just sitting on my butt playing video games or reading all summer. Uh, my parents suggested um, Lucky's, CVS, and Starbucks, which were all close by my house, but I did not want to work in any of those places. I was like, no, -uh, I don't want that stuff. <laughs> uh, let's see. Uh, the workability people at school suggested being a server at a nursing home near the school. Uh, this sounded better to me. I wanted to become a server because uh, I wanted the job that involves like staying in motion, like, you know, like, like you just, you, have you seen servers in restaurants? They just move all the time. Um, uh, let me see, after looking around, I finally settled on Valley Village. Uh, it's very close to my house, like uh, like about maybe, maybe just a couple of blocks away, which is all right. Um, I filled out an application with a little help from my stepdad. I did, did put on my application that I have autism. Um, I didn't hear back from them for a few weeks, but my mom told me to just uh, just keep letting them know about my application. Then, after filling out a work permit from school, as I was only 17, I had an interview with the main manager. Um, before I went to the interview, I made sure to dress light, nice, like something something like this, maybe something along these lines. Um, uh, because I had a white dress shirt, black dress shoes. Like I'm still wearing the shoes now. <laughs> uh, let me see. Um, uh, so, uh, wait a minute, there's not even, wait a second, I just know, what, wait a minute, there's no other, there's barely, <clears throat> sorry, I was just trying to make, I was trying to make a good joke here, mom, 
I was trying to come up with a good joke. There's not even any, there's not any other kids in this. Everybody's an adult or something. This is, this is, this is pointless here. Yeah. Come on, mom, leave me alone. Come on, I'm trying to, trying to, trying to make some jokes here. Okay, okay, okay. Uh, let's see. So, uh, wait, now I'm distracted. Dang it. Thanks. Thank you. Clap, clap that up. Yeah, let me see. Um, where was I? Um, I so then after uh, after a couple of couple of calls, I did get the job. So he gave me an employee handbook. Like uh, like when whenever I get handed something, I just make sure to read it like like word for word everything. So like just all just just everything. Um, leave no stone stone unturned. Am I right? Um, so then uh, he showed me around the dining room, which was like really really. Uh, wall to wall carpet, a few paintings on the walls, around 15 to 20 tables, and then a salad bar in the main kitchen. And, and then while in service, I have to just ask, I have to ask any resident uh, what they want from today's selection and their contract number. The contract number is basically the most important thing because like I have to make sure that they they were there and stuff like that. Um, after a couple of months of working there, um, Joe, the manager, told my mom that I was struggling a bit with the work, and then he was he was worried and wanted to help me keep the job, so mom hired a job coach to help help and observe me. Um, she was concerned that I had struggles with uh, keeping track of the all the numbers, um, so I actually have a, a custom printed sheet or something that that was made for me. Um, um, I mostly go to work early, so that way I can get it, get it all filled out with like the whole menus and stuff like that. Like, there's usually some good stuff, and then there's some bad stuff. I don't know. Like, no offense, but I know some. I know everybody has their different tastes, but I'm like, come on. Um, let me see. Uh, where was I? And then, uh, so I, so I, uh, I have that sheet now, and every every day's been uh, been totally perfect. So that, I, but I know if I still have problems or something, I can just let her know. Let her know and maybe help me out with some stuff. Wait, what time is it again? Does anybody? You have like one minute, my dear, to wrap up. Oh, okay. Sorry about that. Um, uh, so then the cons about having this, I mean, sorry, wait, pros? I got it mixed up. Uh, sorry, the pros about this job, there are friendly residents, there's helpful coworkers, and the managers are really helpful. Uh, there's free refreshments and food to take home. And then the other thing about this, which is completely different from normal restaurants, is that there's no need to handle tips or something. Like, people have tried to offer me cash, but it's, like, against the policy. I'm just like, nope, keep it to yourself. <laughs> uh, let's see. Uh, it's within walking distance of my house, and then being able to walk around freely is a good part of the job. And then the dress code is simple to remember. Um, the other thing is, like, uh, the other negative things are, like, uh, they're hard of hearing, so I have to, like, raise my voice like this. <laughs> <laughs> uh, there's complicated orders, like there's like, uh, what was it? And then um, uh, cleaning up after spills is sometimes annoying. Um, there's also like, we have the dishwasher and then the hot silverware, like that kind of bothered me or something for a while. Um, so after about a year of having this job, I feel as though as I earned sonority over newer people, like there's been a lot of new people recently and I have to be the one who's training them most of the time. Um, let's see. And despite mentioning my disability, nobody nobody seems to like uh, like uh, harass me or anything. So I haven't been harassed or insulted or anything, which is good. Um, so in conclusion, my occupation as a part-time server at a retirement community makes for a great starting point in anyone's career in restaurant service. And uh, any questions? <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you, Rowan. And uh, he kept pointing to his mom over here. So she's going to hate me for this, but too bad. Um, I do want everybody in this room to know about Jennifer Timmerman, who's sitting over here, who runs an amazing parent support group called MOCA. M-O-C-H-A-A. -A. You can find them online. It's a great resource for parents. Jen, you're amazing. So we have, which is why Rowan's so amazing. I mean, we know how this works, right? So we have like, you. you're welcome. We have like three minutes for questions. And I'm sure that's ample time. 
to answer any questions you have. Is there anything burning? You guys are tired. I like it. <laughs> so I think if there's no burning questions, you know how to get a hold of most of us. I think our contact information is indeed on the internet. Thank you so much for your time today, and thanks again to all of our fabulous speakers.